I'm Catherine Arndt, the Chief of the VLGA Connect Studio. Welcome to today's episode, brought to you by the VLGA, your councillor support network and the national broadcaster on all things local government. Hello everyone, it's so good to have you back with us for TGU after a long weekend in Victoria and a couple of other states I think, uh, for Grand Final Weekend, and it's a special edition of TGU this week. Let me introduce our panel. Tony, if you can just sit in the corner there for a moment, because I want to say hello, welcome back, big virtual hug to Julie Reed, who's back from the UK. Hi, Julie. Hi, Chris. Hi, Tony. Fantastic to be back. I'm so excited. I missed you guys. It wasn't quite the same having uh, not being able to sort of interact um yeah uh, and have yeah. a bit of banter around the table uh but can, anyway can I, look, can I um, say can I say Julie and I mean this in the nicest possible way we didn't miss you because we uh, saw you you appeared on the program we saw you in front of the Thames we saw you at Madame Tussauds it was like you were here the whole time oh that's nice and it was really nice to be able to pull together those reports for you I was so excited about what was going on um, overseas, and I wanted to share some of those stories. And I've it had some terrible. really nice feedback. So thank you to those people that have come back to me and said that they enjoyed my reports. It was really a pleasure reporting back for everybody. Was terrific. Uh, Tony Rowanix here. Hello, Tony. Oh, hi, Chris and Julie. I think, um, Julie, you've set a precedent. So when Chris and I go on holidays <laughs> to what the Port Arlington Caravan Park or whatever it is, we our salubrious trips, Chris, we can report back. <laughs> from there, can I'm, we? I'm going to go to the Gold Coast soon. There's a bit happening there, so maybe maybe I will file a report uh, for you. All right, in all seriousness, though, good to have uh, the full team back together to dissect the week in local government. I know we say this a lot, but gosh, there is a lot happening. Can we, off the bat, just send out our thoughts and best wishes to the communities across uh, Gippsland, particularly also the northeast and to the people working in those uh, council areas, emergency services, dealing with a lot at the moment, fires followed by floods. Tony, you and I were chatting before we started recording uh, today about trying to keep up with you know, what the councils in particular are dealing with at the moment. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's across the state. And as you say, um, multiple challenges after those bushfires in in East Gippsland, we, um, we see evacuations um, overnight in Wellingtonshire at in sale around the port of sale multiple mm. um residences have been evacuated and as you say now in the northeast the um the wangaratta council have um have got their mun municipal emergency management plan ready to go the mayor's um dean rees has come out um uh, overnight um warning residents about um the rising ovens river so yeah, a number of councils are coping with um emergency matters at the moment as they do you know year in year out yeah. and and perform a really a key service for residents during those um emergency moments yeah you mentioned dean rees coming to the fore with some messaging there in uh, wangaratta i've heard ian by from wellingtonshire uh, on the abc this is really where that spokesperson role comes to the fore for for, for mayors in their communities julie isn't it yeah it is chris and they always do a fantastic job so um, hang in there to those mayors, keep getting those messages out because it's really important for the community. Um, I looked at the East Gippsland and the Wellington uh, websites this morning. Uh, the list of road closures that they keep updating, quite mind-boggling really, uh, gives you a sense of the scope of the issues that, uh, that those people are dealing with at the moment. So as we say, all power to you and hopefully uh, this all passes as, as quickly as possible. Significant announcement out of the state this week, Tony and Julie, that I'm assuming will have some sort of flow on effect to, to councils. Some councils have differential rates in place, for example, to encourage people to not land bank vacant, particularly residential land, uh, to, to use it or pay higher rates. But the state is now extending a vacant residential land tax across the state. Tony, have you had to think about what the implication of this could be? Yeah, look, I, th I think it, it probably means the council um, rate arrangements for, you know, higher rates for vacant residential land um, will remain. I think um, it's just a, a, another disincentive, if you like, for people to, um, you know, hold on to residential properties and not, you know, make them available for either to, to, 
to be let, to be tenanted, or um, for sale on the private housing market. Oh. This um, vacant residential land tax is applied in um, 16 municipalities in inner and middle Melbourne since, um, I think, 1st of Jan 2018. The announcement is that it's to be extended initially to um, all the regional areas of Melbourne from, um, I think it's 1 January 2025, and then throughout the rest of Melbourne from 1 Jan 26. And what it means is if, if you've got a residential property a you know constructed home that's um unoccupied for a period of six months in a year and they, those six months don't need to be contiguous if it's unoccupied for a total of six months in a year well in the next year then you'll you'll be liable as the owner for this um vacant residential land tax which is one percent of the capital improved Right. value so if you've got a property worth um a million dollars capital improved value then you'll be paying ten thousand dollars annual tax so it's so quite a significant um impost now holiday homes it'll be exempt but right. oh, there's a there's a lot of detail in here that i think's going to be scary um you've got to notify by the 15th of january every year if you're claiming that that residential property that you own in 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 um out that's not your home you're mm. claiming it as a holiday home so if you, you've got to notify the state revenue office by the 15th of january every year not a very handy time a lot of people are on holidays and mm. doing other things and if you don't it's a deemed notification default and you're going to have to pay a penalty so wow. um yeah there's a lot of um detail in this devil um, really in the detail isn't it yeah we don't give tax advice, folks, but I tell you what, there's a lot to look at in, yeah. in this one. Yeah. Hey, Julie, uh, while you were yeah. away, I, I, I doubt it made headlines in the UK, but you missed the housing and the planning reforms from the I former know. Premier, Dan Andrew. Did you catch up on that? We've got a new well, Premier. Well, it was interesting, Chris, because in London, you know, you, you didn't even hear about Dan Andrews going. So uh, yeah. that just goes to show where it is on the on the radar of the world market. Well, that just tells you me know, their priorities are probably right. To me, <laughs> surprising to me to find out when I was sitting at the airport scrolling through things, oh, my goodness, the Premier's gone. And there's a whole lot of uh, new um, housing provisions mm. and a housing statement that's been released which, you know, never really made the news over there. So news to me, I am really pleased to see this element, though, coming forward. There's been a number of years where councils have lobbied the government about this whole issue of land banking. It's been going on for many, many years. It's good to see now it's been rolled out into other areas. I think I know that the devil's in the detail, but, you know, if they're serious about... Um, land being developed about people not holding on to land then you know they've got to put these kind of measures I think in place to be able to get development moving because you know you can't just blame councils for not processing applications soon enough you know it's not just about that it's there's a whole lot of other things that it that it relates to and this is one of them people hang on to land they don't develop it and that means that there's one less house or multiple less houses um on land yeah. as, a, as a result of people just holding on, waiting for the right time to develop. So I, I, I welcome this. I think this is um, really needed across the state. And and on that point of, of councils processing applications, you might have missed some of this at the time. I think it was Deputy President of the MOV, Jennifer Anderson, who made one of the early statements about how uh, councils have processed, I think it was 120,000 applications that have not been acted on by the developers market, the builders market. So it's that's a correct. it's 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 yeah. a collection of 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 things mm -hmm. that's being brought in here, isn't it, to try and move the dial. But you'd be forgiven for missing this one, Julie, because it wasn't <laughs> in there. The the right. residential land tax was not in that original statement right. around housing and planning. Okay. Yeah. And arguably arguably, Quint reports that the the new premier herself might have missed it. I think the treasurer made the announcement and might have caught um, some of his colleagues off guard in in, yeah. in the cabinet, according mm. to some media reports, at least. Mm. Now, speaking speaking of the cabinet, that's been announced uh, this week. The treasurer hasn't changed. The local government minister hasn't changed. The planning minister hasn't changed. There's been a few other tweaks 
in, in portfolios that do intersect with uh, with councils, which is interesting to see. A new, I think, minister for the suburbs, Tony. That's Julian, right. Either, yeah, you've been through that. That's, that's Sonia Kilkenny um, who's Sonia's picked up that. that. As yeah. well, that the Minister yeah. for Planning. But can we say um, cabinet reshuffle as predicted on TGU last yes. week, Chris? Yes, yeah. I'm sure Chris I'm sure people, I'm Must sure have people had inside school. information, guys. <laughs> um, maybe we highlight um, Colin Brooks, who's a former councillor in the uh, city of Banyul, I think former mayor yeah. of, of Banyul as well. Mm has been appointed Minister for Development Victoria and Minister for Precincts. Mm. So I can imagine there'll be um, a, a strong sort of interface with um, council operations, major activity centres, et cetera, and great to see someone with, you know, real substantive um, local government experience in the Cabinet um, with a key ministry. There'll be a nice working together of Sonia Kilkenny, Harriet Shing and Colin Brooks, I think, all on the housing agenda because I see that obviously Sonia Kilkenny has been given the, the planning reforms around the housing statement to sort of hold on to, um, but obviously Harriet Shing having the, uh, being the Minister for Housing will will obviously have um, good connections there. So I think, a, you know, a nice sort of balance of representation across the state um, working on the housing issue, which I observed. Yeah, interesting. So, so we've got a minister for suburbs. We've got a minister for precincts. Am I right? I'm just looking through the list that we no longer have this suburban development ministerial portfolio. Has that gone by the wayside or has it just been renamed? Depends on what the suburbs is. So I'm not too sure what's happened within the department around suburban development. I think it still exists. But um, maybe it's now linked to, I've assumed that it's linked to the suburbs portfolio yeah. with the rest of the planning. Uh, so, yeah, interesting. Maybe I can find out a bit of information about that. Yeah, I just wondered that as we were we were talking there, because I did note the release talked about a number of machinery of government changes, which will obviously flow on from these portfolio changes coming in in early 2024. So that'll be an interesting one to keep an eye on. The other one, that's of interest, I think, uh, to local government is this uh, government services portfolio. The Minister for Government Services was Danny Pearson, I think, and uh, is now, help me here, I've lost it, Gabrielle Williams as the Minister for Government Services. All right. Uh, so as we say, there's been a bit happening there at the state level that has flown effects to uh, councils. Let's have a look at some council related news uh, this week. We might jump to the Glen Ira story. This has got a little bit of uh, press from the age this week. Jim McGee, the mayor there, who's a friend of the program and keeps us informed about things happening uh, around the sector, which we always appreciate, uh, they've made a preliminary decision, and I'm sure a challenging one for them, to close three childcare centres potentially by the end of the year. Not a new topic for us on TGU, Tony, the challenges that councils have in operating these types of centres in a very competitive environment, market. That, that's right. And 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 councils, um, as we... we the th we know Julian Chris will, will often ha step in where there's a community need that's not being um, serviced by the market, and um, and that's what occurred some decades back um, in Glen Ira when um, council stepped in to provide much needed childcare services. Um, the as you say, it's a preliminary decision, but in the statement from um, Jim McGee, the mayor, he. Um, he, he, he refers to the fact that um, over the past couple of decades, we've seen a real boom in childcare um, availability in, in Glen Ira, such that the council, um, the three council facilities provide only 2% of the available childcare spaces in the city of Glen Ira. We're talking about three facilities in um, Caulfield, Carnegie and Murrumbina, respectively. And those facilities run at an annual loss to council of, of 570,000 per annum. So understandably, um, council is um, looking at its its budget and its arrangements and, you know, in circumstances where there are plenty of alternatives for residents, um, then um, it would seem to be, you know, a, a reasonable decision for council to get out of that market. Um, I understand there's nine further non-council childcare facilities in the planning phase in Glen Ira um, as we speak. So 
Um, interesting decision. Um, council has written to the affected um, parents, guardians, etc., of children in the last week um, to warn them that potentially from I think twenty one December these facilities might shut down. And Julie, I think this that's has been an important point. Yeah, that that Tony's saying is that they're they're now consulting directly with those families. Now, obviously, this kind of decision is not going to be popular, but. Um, you know, it is financially responsible for councils to consider where they've got centres like this that are ageing, that really would need significant investment to bring them up to modern standards, where they're, op where they're operating at such a loss in terms of, you know, half a, half a million dollars per year. That's a significant amount of budget that they need to consider. Well, really, do we want to still be in it um, when we've got these kind of losses? So I think it's... Uh, financially responsible decision for the council to be thinking about things like that um, because they're going to need to invest in those centres to bring them up to standards anyway and, and you know, is it really worth it when they've got all these other uh, centres that are operating across, you know, across the municipality so successfully? So the, you know, the council's not going to leave people, you know, without any any kind of service. I think it's really about uh, being responsible in their decision making, and um, you know, I think it seems pretty sound. So it'd be interesting to see what the community say, but it's a very emotive issue. So yes. you're not getting a lot of people coming out saying, "Yay, council for being financially responsible." Well, you know, no, you're only going to hear from those directly impacted, yeah. which you know, the age has already cherry picked a few for their for their article because yeah. it's conflict that sells newspapers, obviously. That's so right. let's find the people who disagree. But it's mm. the long, it, it's just the latest in a very long list of mm. this type of consideration that councils have been having to do for for many years now in the childcare space, the kindergarten space the aged care space, et cetera. And uh, I hate to say it, but there's a there's an element of I told you so here that goes back to 2014 when rate capping first came in and people were saying rate capping won't cause this sort of thing immediately, but have a look five, 10 years down the track to see the impact that it will have. And here it is, I think. Yeah, I agree. Some may, some may disagree. Uh, Julie doesn't. That's good. Uh, I'm not alone. Uh, historic event in the north in your stomping ground, uh, Tony, uh, this week where Whittlesey, Hume and Mitchell came together for, I haven't heard of too many of these, a joint council meeting, which is a new uh, provision in the 2020 Local Government Act, all around setting up this uh, this new boom suburb of Cloverton, which straddles the three council areas for a uh, for a local government uh, geek like you and i tony this is pretty exciting it, it is um section 62 of the local government act it is folks and i wondered when this would be um triggered but yes um so this historic joint council meeting this week um all about you know a a, a, a really significant new residential um area cloverton's going to be when it's c completed roughly half the size of a Box Hill or a Dandenong, 380,000 people to reside there, 50,000 jobs. It'll be a metropolitan activity centre. It's around um, Calcalo, you know, on the, you know, the, the um, Hume Highway on the way out of Melbourne. Um, and, um, you know, statements um, and historic photographs and statements this week from people like, um, you know, the Mayor of Mitchell, Fiona Stevens, the Mayor of Hume, Joseph Wheel, and and also the the Chair of the Administrators at Whittlesey, um, Lydia Wilson. Um, interestingly, this led me to read that section, Julian, Chris, section six. Of course, I would expect nothing less. Tony. That's what we lawyers do late at <laughs> night when we're bored. Um, well, actually, we get excited when we read these things. Um the quorum, the quorum for three councils meeting together under Section 62, really interesting. What you, what you do, you work out what's a majority of council laws yes. in each of the three respective municipalities. So you work out, you know, what's a majority in Mitchell? What's a majority in Whittlesey? What's a majority in Hume? You add that number up, that's your quorum. However, all you need is three councillors from a municipality right uh -huh. that makes sense so you might make up your quorum by having much many more from another council okay and, and an equal and, number from each yeah and of course in this case we've got administrators uh, mm. 
Whittlesey, but for for the for the sake of the legislation, they would count as councillors. Mm. Mm. But I saw an historic photo on the I think it was on the Mitchell website of um, yes. a group of um, councillors and administrators together and signing some resolutions together, and yeah, um, just shows that you know this is a possible um, way that councils can you know deal collectively with um you know a major decision that impacts um you know across a, yeah. a couple of municipalities yes they're and all standing in front of the honor boards there at uh, the city of Whittlesea. yeah and chris this photo. is music to my ears this is the kind of stuff that i've been looking for and hoping that councils would do together you know working in partnership you know, joint working on on common issues. It's something that I think that I've been banging on about for a long time. Yeah. Knowing that the state government would expect the councils to work like this together, that's why the provision is in the Act. You know, they were expecting that councils were going to work more jointly together, work in regional groups, etc. You know, we want more of this to happen because, you know, the, the, the community don't care about the boundaries. That's the true. Not interested about where those boundaries are. They're just interested in making sure that the services are provided that they they need uh, within um, close proximity to where they're living. And so this is about working together to make sure that community is looked after. So hats off to Hume, Whittlesea and Mitchell. I think this is great. And I think it's setting the standard for what other councils should be thinking about as well in terms of working together for their communities. And we've focused on the significance of the three councils coming together. Let's just focus for a moment on the significance of why this underscores the extraordinary growth that's happening, not just in the north, but in this case, to the north of the city. Um, the Age did an article on this that talks about how Calcalo just six years ago was 100 people. It's now 6,000. And this mm -hmm. Cloverton area is going to be 380,000 people before too long a city the size of Canberra of its own. Um, extraordinary, isn't it, those numbers? Oh, I know. And, and we know the growth is huge for not only Melbourne but Victoria as well. I mean, we heard from Mark Dupay the other day on your Leaders Roundup, um, Chris, and he talked about the massive growth that's happening even in, in Bawbaw. So, you know, it, it, it's significant across all of Victoria. All right. Uh, a couple of stories that have, well, here's one that just appeared very late this morning. Uh, the state government has announced an extension of the e-scooter trial in Victoria. And when you read this press release, Tony and Julie, uh, it's not clear where this applies, but I thought the trial had only been in like four council areas, but it's being extended for six months. And um, uh, the government is saying that'll take it through the uh, the summer period and we'll see what the, what the impact is. Was your understanding... Tony, that it was only a couple of council areas. Well, I had understood it was certainly the, the, the city of Melbourne. <laughs> you can't come into the CBD these days and not see these scooters. Mm. Um, Yarra, um, Port Phillip, and one of the big regionals, of course, in Ballarat. Mm. Um, but um, nonetheless, yeah, the government are persisting with e-scooters, despite, you know, there's, there's been um, concerns about safety, pedestrian safety. We've had a lot of accidents as I say, I can't walk outside my building on William Street without seeing someone racing down um, a road without mm. any protective gear mm. on at, at something like, you know, 40 k's an hour. I think these scooters are generally uh, set to a lower speed limit, but you can upgrade them privately and some people do and to make them more powerful. Yeah. yeah. But um, I guess we're looking at lateral solutions to the the, the road you know, cars um, and 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 the congestion on our on our streets and uh, scooters are seen as a um, a more environmentally friendly way of commuting around. Um, but yeah, they're not um, uncontroversial. There's um, there's certainly some safety issues um, for both yeah. the riders and pedestrians. So assuming it applies in the four areas that we understood the trial was that you've outlined, uh, Tony, um, it's not clear from the government's announcement today, but what is in there, Julie, that I thought was of interest, the Department mm -hmm. of Transport and Planning is mm -hmm. developing a guide for councils with advice on how to manage e-scooter share schemes, including parking management and operator insurance requirements. Yeah, which is is really good. 
increase. I think there needs to be some kind of guide to help councillors. And so there's a consistency of approach as well. Um, look, um, being just coming back from London, um, hmm. <laughs> and seeing the scooters in London and just being horrified at really at, at the uh, at the the risks that riders were taking. Now they're doing trials over in London as well, but apparently the leaders in this space are France. France has been doing a lot of trials, and I think London are looking to potentially Paris and France to see what they're um, achieving over there because they've done lots and lots of work in this space. So um, whether or not the the government are looking overseas might be a good idea for them to have a look at what's happening in France and London because, you know, we're talking about very complex environments in terms of transport. I mean, we think we've got issues here. When you look at the environment over there with the, you know, clash between cars and buses and taxis and mm. and uh you know normal bikes and then scooters thrown in it, it is just it's chaos it really is an actual fact where where they've gone to in london is they're they're uh they're taxing more on cars to get cars out of central london yes. they obviously mm. had a original congestion charge but they're now taxing on those cars, I believe, that um, are not electric vehicles. And so you're finding that there's there's a, re a reduction in cars coming through central London. And so it's becoming more popular, I suppose, to, to use things like scooters. So, look, I think I think the, if the government can look at what's going on over there, I think it's it would be interesting to see how it, how it compares and what they've come up with over there as well. That inner city scheme you mentioned, I think, has just been extended recently and has made a lot of headlines. It's been quite controversial, mm -hmm. hasn't it? Sadiq Khan, yeah. the... The mayor of uh, Melbourne has been leading the charge there. So um, that's the e-scooter trial extended for six months, and uh, you'll find that announcement has come from the government this morning. A couple of stories council-related that have hit the news this week, particularly ABC News that we might just mention in passing. Interesting one out of Swan Hill, Tony, where the mm. ASU has made claims about a bullying culture there. This all stems from, as I understand it, an organisation restructure or at least a proposed yeah. restructure with a reasonably new CEO, you'd expect that sort of process to be underway? Yeah, you'd, you'd kind of expect a union reaction from sometimes from a from a major, you know, workplace restructure. But um on the face of it, you know, the union has 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 expressed some concerns about um what's going on in the workplace there and and some of the cultures. Um the, the CEOs come out and 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 rightly so and said you know take those allegations seriously um Scott this says Scott Barber and um no doubt we'll, they'll work through some processes there up at Swan Hill where there's I think 300 odd staff so it's a significant um employer in in that region and, and Julie you'll you talk yeah. about councils um oh, did you want to make a comment on that story Yes, I did actually, because you know I've obviously um, had a bit to do with Swan Hill in in um, over the last twelve months, right. and you know I I always think there's two sides to the story. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that. But I can say that there is pretty solid um, and professional leadership up at Swan Hill. Um, change is always difficult for people, um, and especially when it hasn't been reviewed for a long time. You know, people get comfortable and I think that, you know, good on the leadership team for having a review of probably what is overdue. Um, and, you know, I, I would say, you know, probably as what Tony said, not surprising that they're going through a review at this stage. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, I think that possibly my view is that it's, probably been unfairly represented in the media. Uh, that wouldn't surprise, uh, Julie. Uh, but here's one that you probably are pretty pleased about. Uh, Ten councils, I think Swan Hill's one of them, joining together to appoint a, a housing officer. So this is from Macedon Ranges in the south to Mildura in the north, and this is all about trying to pool their resources together to move the needle on the housing needs. That's right. And I'm not surprised to see this, Chris, because I know that they've been doing a lot of really good work on housing in this Loddon Mallee region. There's been a lot of work that's been done by the councils. They've joined together. They've got a whole lot of data and a whole lot of information. So it's great. Um, you know, they I think they're saying that they need to create 152,000 new homes in that region. Um, they've got this, this region-wide 
housing action plan which is driving all of that and so what they've done is appointed this person for for 12 months or well they will appoint this person for 12 months initially I suspect they've probably got a lot more work than 12 months but um, a good good trial of having someone in there supporting them and driving that agenda so a big area um, a really, really important project and, um, you know, a great use of pooling resources to to get what they need to support them in the delivery of the, the well-needed housing. We know, we know a lot of these councils are finding it really difficult to employ people because they can't give them housing in their region to be yeah. able to, you know, to live and work locally. Um, I've had some real examples given to me about where people want to you know, work for these councils, but they can't find houses yeah. to live in. Mm. You say probably more than 12 months of work. I think they admit that themselves. They're hoping with the government's stated uh, focus and priority on housing reform that the government might step in and provide some support to continue that role post that first uh, 12 months. Yeah. So well done to those uh, yeah. 10 councils in the Loddon Mallee. Uh, Tony, we've had a councillor resignation and before Julie asks, this is number 51 for the term ah. of for a required count back or by-election. On that last question, I noticed West Wimmera has said they're waiting for advice on which of those two would be required. Yeah, is it uh, Councillor Trevor Damashens? Um, after seven years, two terms mm. on the council has decided it's time for him to step down and retire. And yes, yet another either a count back or a by-election um, in a Victorian municipality the yeah. 51st time. With 12 yeah. months to go. So I wonder um, where we'll end up uh, on, on this. Oh, bets it's... are on. Bets are on. How many? How many by the well, end do of we the think, term? Do we think um, uh, sitting councillors who are thinking of not running are more likely to step aside before the election or see out the last 12 months? Will it taper off, do you think, or will it go the other way? I'm, I'm hoping it will taper off, Chris. I think they will see the end of it and might want to just close, close off unless there's really compelling reasons you know whether that mm. to do with you know health or family or whatever you know i think it'll taper off um okay. anyway we'll see we don't we All don't right. want to lose we don't really want to lose anymore if we can let's try and keep it at 51 but you know who knows jlf can we just mark that prediction there from julie in case we need to call on that clip <laughs> at some uh, future future point in time what do you reckon tony look i i, I think I'm glad that we've got the count back system so we don't have that voter fatigue element mm. um, if you had to go to a by-election every time. But I feel for, you know, rate payers, if they have to sort of get their heads around, you know, who's my local representative for a month or two or three months and then, um, you know, you have to make a decision, you know, yeah. at, at the polls shortly thereafter. Um, and... Um, you know, it, but there are individual reasons why each of these councillors um, has made this call and um, there, there may well be, you know, really um, important prevailing personal reasons for some of the councillors to need to, to to make that decision. But I'm, you know, I'm with Julie. I think um, we'd prefer to see continuity in yeah. the, across the sector in between election periods. In, in this case with the West Wimmera councillor who's stepping down or has stepped down, I noticed uh, he'd only just come back from a period of leave, but there wasn't much more said about reasons for that. But I, I think the majority of those who've stepped down during the term have talked uh, um, at least a bit about the increasing workload on councillors and the pressures of balance, balancing a council responsibility with uh, professional and uh, family responsibilities mm. so i think that's important yeah. context to sort of cons consider as we move towards the next election cycle and people think about whether they want to put their hand up for uh, a councillor role um, just on by-elections uh, there is one coming up on the 2nd of december it's been set for marunda you remember while julie was away i think we had the resignation of marika graham there so that one will be a by-election conducted by post a couple of interstate stories to look at in passing as time ticks away. The Cootamundra Gundagai Regional Council demerger looks to be back on track. This one was announced uh, many months ago. Change of government, then it was all up in the air. The new local government minister there, Ron Honig, has put a, a plan back to the council and said, if you can complete this plan by early next year and present me with a way forward for two individual councils, 
he'll uh, he'll put that into effect. The councillors are a bit disappointed that they're not getting the support from the state government that they were hoping to have, but they're saying they'll push on. So this will be an interesting test case in the current. And is that a, a lack of funding? My understanding was a lack of funding coming through from the government to help the council implement the plan. Is that is that your understanding, Chris? Yeah, I think the mayor there, Charlie Sheehan, said they would have liked to see some resource and funding uh, from yeah. the government to help with that. But it looks like they've been uh, put a plan to to proceed, but to uh, to basically carry it out themselves uh, mm. based on media comments. It's a it's a, it's a long road to. Gundagai City Council <laughs> again, <laughs> or to a to a demerger. Yes, uh, Tony. Thank you. Uh, first prize for you today. Uh, here's one that'll really surprise you both. Broken Hill, another New South Wales council. The councillors there uh, were looking at the recommendation that they be awarded a three percent. I think it was increase in their allowances. They decided to put it to the community, asking the community, "Do you think we should get a pay rise?" Guess what the community said? Oh, what would they say? No Chris? way. <laughs> That's about uh, right. Yes. Why so, would you put something like that to the community? Oh well, they're being open. They're going to say no. They're aren't being they? open and transparent, aren't they? Yeah, they, I suppose. But putting that to the public vote, you know, of course you wouldn't support it, would you? Would you? They support? might have thought they were much loved in the community, and the community would say you you're well deserving of a pay rise in the middle of a cost of living crisis. Yeah, that's 34 right. And I mean, people. you know, they're. Yeah, they're arguing. Is that right? Was, you know, the cost of living, the increases of cost of living. Um, and the fact that they thought that that would be passed on to the ratepayers, yeah. um, mm. you know, of course they're going to say that sort of stuff. And, and look, there are pressures of cost of living rises. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, it sort of then becomes, oh, is it a bit of a thankless task? The councillors then sort of, I don't know, are they are they then going to be thinking, well, people don't value what we do anymore? Does that mean yep. that they sort of then start to do less? Because mm. they're saying well, the community don't really value what we're doing. I don't know. I mean, it's a it's a bit of a yeah for them to think that they were going to get you know support on something like this. I just yeah, it, it sort of I don't know. I'm <laughs> I'm a bit surprised that they went out with something. I, I like was that. too, which is why I put this one in the list uh, for discussion. As as Tony points out, only thirty four people out of I think nearly four hundred uh, mm. said yes, you should get a pay rise. Yeah, That's right. and, and it's an interesting precedent, isn't it? Because um, you know, what does a council continue to go to these online polls in this situation? In which case, you know, we're going to be in you know twenty fifty something um, <laughs> councillors getting getting yeah. you know paid the equivalent of uh, you know a loaf of bread or something a week. Um, yeah. It it's uh you know um I, I understand what the the political messages it sends. It says you know we're 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 not doing this in a vacuum. We want to hear what the community think. But um, you know, uh, Broken Hill would be you know it's a major regional city, and having only four hundred people voting suggests to me that people weren't that worked up about the issue. Good point. But of course, you'd expect that those um who who were were voting were probably wanting to express some disquiet about the council may may not be happy with um mm. council in relation to other matters and are voting um against the pay rise um really just consistent with their attitude about council potentially yeah well it, it underscores why uh these decisions generally these days are made by an independent uh remuneration mm. type uh, tribunal doesn't it to take that politics uh out of the decision so there you go exactly uh, Good on Broken Hill, I suppose, for putting it to the community, but no surprise with the outcome. And they've since uh, considered the outcome formally at a council meeting and agreed not to take the pay rise. All right. Uh, and a compromise in Adelaide on the prayer. We talked about this one a few weeks back, uh, Tony. This might have been before you went away, Julie, where uh, one of the councillors there was threatening legal action because the council had decided to drop mm. the prayer from the start of the meeting and replace it with a non-denominational pledge a compromise now where they're going to say a, a multi-faith prayer as well as use that pledge and the legal uh, threat has gone away. Yeah, that's right. I did see that. So we had the um, pledge in place for, I think, two council meetings, and now we um, we move also to the multi-faith prayer. We pray for wisdom, courage, empathy, understanding and guidance in the decisions we make while seeking and respecting the opinions of others. So 
you know, nice, nice words. I think we'd all agree with the, um, with, 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 with the theme yeah. there. Um, but um, yeah, that, it's good to see we've reached some resolution. We didn't need to go to the courts in the city of Adelaide. Yes. Emotive issues. We we're talking about emotive issues before. Julie, this is another one. I think it's a good compromise. It's only going to lengthen the meeting, but um, you know, if they've been able to come up with a compromise which suits majority of people, then you know, good on them. It's it's probably a, a good way forward. Um, I've, I've put a couple of stories together in our list here. We don't have to talk to them uh, all, but really just to show that this issue of elected members copping abuse from, in many cases, the community, sometimes within their own uh, group, but in these cases from the community, from uh, from a fairly um, serious but mild example through to a really extreme example. So in the UK, Kent County Council members are being offered counselling because of the increase in abuse from constituents. In Utah, in the US, a mayor was hit and spat on after a council meeting because he spoke critically about some local journalist reports and it was the daughter of the journalist that allegedly attacked the mayor outside the meeting there's video of that online Mm. to the example in israel where municipal elections are coming up later this month and arab israeli candidates are being targeted for murder so we've had all these cases of murder happening of municipal candidates leading not surprisingly to many dropping out of those council races now that's an extreme that we never want to see i know know. and look you know you remember not that long ago chris and tony we were talking about staff being targeted Mm. at councils as well and while i was overseas i saw signs up about you know non-tolerance of abusive behavior towards staff in in local government so Mm. you know there's a general trend here about you know the, the the disrespect towards council workers and elected officials. So, you know, it is it is problematic. And, uh, you know, it is something that um, no doubt the councils are thinking about, well, how do, we, how do we address this? What kind of communication do we put out to our communities about the non-tolerance of this kind of behaviour? It, it, is, yeah. it is interesting because you see uh, it's not confined to councils. We've seen, you know, I think, remember Julia Gillard got a sandwich thrown mm-hmm. at her once and we're all, all, you know, people have had eggs and this sort of stuff. But The Chief Minister other... in uh, the Northern Territory got a pie in the face, I think. That's that's last correct, week. quite yeah. recently. So, yeah. but but typically, um, you know, at a, at a federal or a state level, there are security, members of security mm-hmm. around to protect mm-hmm. the, the elected official. Um, you know, are we coming to a scenario where, you know, a, a, a mayor... You know, being out in public might have um, some sec- a security detail. I hope, I hope that's not the case. And at least these are isolated in- incidents um, in terms of um, the Australian examples. And um, yeah, we we hope to see there's a better level of respect generally. Yeah. All right, Julie, uh, you've mm. been reflecting a bit on what you were seeing and hearing about in uh, in Scotland in particular. And of course, you reported for us on this. Your pick of the week is. Uh, a democracy matters movement there? That's right, Chris. Uh, it's interesting that uh, when I went and met with COSLA over in Scotland, um, that's the, the representative body for local government, uh, they were talking about this uh, review that they were undertaking. And, you know, people across Scotland at the moment are being asked to suggest ways of increasing local control over decision-making, which is interesting. So they're really pushing forward with this, how can the community take charge of a lot of the things that are happening locally and support local government in doing that? So there's a whole lot of consultation that's going on. Um, They involved about 4,000 people in the first phase of this Democracy Matters conversation and they were able to... um, try and work through with the community what what is really important to them. So um, so it's part of a wider local governance review that's going on um, and, and it's considering how powers and resources should be shared between both the national and local government and with the communities. So, um, you know, there's certainly a movement to try and retain control or even con- increase control of local government and the communities across Scotland. So an interesting one to watch. I will keep 
keep an eye on it. Um, there is this Verity House agreement that's been drafted up between uh, COSLA, uh, between local government and um, the uh, national government. And that is to grow this stronger partnership between national and local government. And um, it's meant to uh, reflect the importance of the communities being sort of front and centre of all of this. So, so this partnership approach is meant to deliver better outcomes for, for communities. So you'll recall in my report, or you may or may not, that um, you know I was talking about how at one stage, we had a really strong agreement between state government and local government here in Victoria, yeah. um, which sort of fell by the wayside. And there was a discussion a while ago about trying to update that agreement. Well, there's some really good work going on overseas that we could look at. And I think it's something that maybe needs to be continue to be discussed at local government about how can there be good respect between the two levels of government. How can we work better together to have um, good outcomes for our community? And the classic example of that is, you know, all these planning controls, all these changes in housing, we're talking about how can local government participate with yeah. the government in getting really good outcomes. You know, there's a lot of talk about that at the moment. What is the, the government going to do to work with local government to make sure that there are good outcomes in that space? And to respect local government in that process yeah. and yeah. Uh, and and include local government. Like we've already seen things get gazetted without any consultation yes. or notice whatsoever. So that agreement certainly might still exist, but it's not being actively no. considered, I would suggest. That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. That's really interesting. We'll keep an eye on what's coming out of Scotland there. A couple of light ones to finish off. You spotted this one in, uh, this is in the UK as well, I think, uh, which is obviously your go-to place uh, for news, <laughs> where a developer who's a bit miffed about ongoing uh, issues with a council leader has decided to immortalise that council leader in a gargoyle. Yes, a gargoyle. Let's have a, look, let's have a look at a picture of this. Yeah. Oh, it's hilarious. So this gargoyle um, has uh, landed on this development, and this is the leader of the council uh, face. <laughs> mm. That looks quite distorted. He's sticking his tongue out. Quite interesting. <laughs> and sticking his tongue out. Uh, it's landed on this development as a. Uh, as a as a as a sculpture to the community. Now, often you know we will have sculptures of leaders and very prominent people after they pass away. Normally, never have we had one um, on a development of a leader that is still alive. So it's an interesting <laughs> picture. It's a very very cheeky move by the developer, and this is in Trowbridge Town Council. Um, and the leader is Stuart Parman. So I suspect that he's probably not very happy about this. Well, no, actually. Putting this up on the on the uh, on the roof of this this development. Well, actually, Julie, not. So it, this is in a town of about thirty seven thousand people. So it's not an insignificant uh, town. But Mr. Parman says, uh, I suspect it was put there to wind me up. But I'm quite proud of it. I live just around oh. the corner, so I quite like it. He says. Do you believe that? Do you <laughs> believe that? I I would not be happy. I I think he's just saying that for the media. Potentially. Like oh, I, that? That I don't know. I, I, don't I reckon being cast in stone, you know, you, immortalized. You're, you're, you're immortalized. But um, sticking out. I don't think so. I don't believe that. <laughs> Tony, I know this takes you back, doesn't it, to your Nillenbeck it does. it does take me back. Um, anything they can do in the UK. We, we've been doing this in Australia. When, when I was um, uh, back in the day at Nillenbeck Council, which, of course, I've got a um, connection to having been a councillor back in the day, at Nillenbeck, we had in the, in the um, 2000s, I think about 2007, we had a scenario where we had a a VCAT dispute where a, 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 um, a resident was seeking uh, approval to construct a home in North Warrandyte, just um, near the Yarra River there in uh, the southern part of Nilambik. And there was a 12-month um, VCAT set of VCAT proceedings after this went through council. The applicant, it cost them uh, $20,000 to navigate through VCAT. And afterwards, um, when they... 
those proceedings were completed, they wanted to express in a, an artistic way their feelings about <laughs> their neighbour to the south, and they constructed this um, piece of artwork. I'm not sure if we can get an image up, but um, if you're not, if you're listening and not watching, you're missing out, folks, because <laughs> um, what you would be seeing is a 4.8 metre high structure weighing some oh what was it um uh 1.5 tons that this um landowner erected in their backyard and it was well let's say it's um a, a hand with one finger extended um i think that means <laughs> something um <laughs> colloquially folks um and it was pointed it in the appropriate like direction it? towards the neighbour. Um, <laughs> what ultimately it. happened is council actually got a lot of complaints about this, Nilamit Council, oh, not surprising. and determined that the structure was so large, it itself needed a planning permit. <laughs> um, so um, the uh, owner, I think, put it up for sale on eBay. So it's out there somewhere if you want to uh, purchase this structure and get a planning permit if you're planning on putting it up. But it might be in some art gallery somewhere, Julie. It might well be. Were you mayor at the time, Tony? I wasn't. I wasn't. But I recall it fondly. And um, it featured prominently on the front page of um, various leader newspapers. And I think probably in the Metro Dailies at the time it was. Um, and it became a bit of a tourist attraction. I've got to is say that right? people drove to see it. <laughs> and the question is, should it actually require a planning permit? <laughs> exactly. Or should it be exempt in the future? <laughs> Or they're all going to be questions for another day. I would just say I do prefer the big magpie in Yaroa that's been put up recently to this sort of uh, public artwork, but that's that's just me. All right, uh, we've covered a lot of ground as always, and uh, great to get all those insights into things happening around the big, wide, wonderful world of local government. Uh, just leaves me to thank Julie Reed for joining us back from your trip. Lovely to have you back, Julie, and thank you. Um... Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Tony. It's such a pleasure to be back. And I'm never going away for a month again because too much happens when I'm away. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention the jet lag you deal with when Not you come back. Not to mention the jet yeah. lag, which, you know, that's okay. It's worth it to do a big trip. So um, everybody take a break. It's worth it. It brings you a lot of energy to come back and get absorbed back into what's going on in this fantastic state of ours. It makes you appreciate when you come back what a beautiful place it is that we that we live in. Lovely. Lovely. Thank you, Julie. We'll see you next week, hopefully. Tony, thank you. Another big week. And uh, I hope uh, we, you'll be with us to do it all again next week. Yeah, I, I reckon I'll come back, Chris. Nothing else to do. <laughs> well, you've got that lovely microphone in front of you now. You've got to get use out of it to, to pay for it, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Tony Rannick and Julie uh, Reed. Tony, of course, from Hunt and Hunt Lawyers, our sponsors of TGU here from VLGA Connect. Check out our uh, our feed for the podcast and on YouTube for a new local leaders that dropped a few days ago with the reclusive CEO of Nilambic Shire Council, Carl Cowie. A bit of an exclusive uh, chat with Carl there. And stay tuned for more from local leaders soon as well. That's it for today. We'll join you soon for more VLGA Connect. Bye for now.